and turn it over to Alyssa. Thank you. Um, so as Jenny said, my name is Alyssa Nance. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And this first slide has a link actually to the slides in that go link. Um, so thank you for joining me for Not Your Mama's Small Claims Tribunal, Basics of the Case Act. Oops, I didn't I don't know why my computer did that. Um, so my goal today is to provide enough information about what the CASE Act is and does without overwhelming you. I'm going to do my best to provide a comprehensible summary, um, but I don't think it's possible to really understand the potential ramifications without getting into some of the details. Unfortunately, <laughs> I've seen some general public media reporting on it, um, but it's mostly been just too vague to be useful. Um, and it's also been either what I would consider to be overly hand wringing or just too uncritical. Um, the CASE Act is controversial among different copyright stakeholder groups, and there are some little bit legitimate concerns about it. Um, so I also wanna kind of try to parse those out a little bit and talk about what kind of implications there may be for libraries and our communities. Um, and before we go any further, if anyone has like a pressing question, like I say something that totally, you're totally lost, um, please feel free to interrupt me. I am not watching the chat. Um, so if Jenny needs to stop me, um, I will stop for questions in the middle, but um, don't, don't feel afraid to interrupt me. Um, <laughs> before we dig in, I want to, everyone knows this, reiterate, I am not a lawyer, I'm not a copyright expert, and I am definitely not qualified to offer legal advice. Um, that said, I am absolutely happy to answer questions as best I can. Um, I'm gonna offer a lot of my own opinions today, but there's probably a lot I just don't know. And I think um, even expert opinions will probably shift as this is enacted and we get more information. So with that said, what's in the CASE Act and what does it do? The full name of the law is the Copyright Alternative in Small Claims Enforcement Act of 2020. Um, and I actually just this morning realized that it was no longer <laughs> the Case Act of 2019. Um, I fixed that. Uh, so, it, but it's been under discussion and kind of hanging around in Congress for a while. Um, I think it's, there was a study in like 2018 and it was proposed in 2019, um, but it was only passed and signed into law just this past December as part of the huge spending bill that included all that COVID related funding. Um, and the most significant point is that the act creates a body of officials within the copyright office that is there to make decisions in small claims filings and to determine what damages to assign. And I've used the word adjudicate here on this slide because that's functionally what the Copyright Claims Board will do, but it's actually not part of the court system at all. Um, that's a detail to keep in mind. Uh, the CASE Act also lowers barriers to filing because up to this point, that has had to be done in federal court in order to make copyright claims. Um, and that's just incredibly expensive. You need an expert lawyer to help you. So theoretically, a copyright holder could navigate this process themselves and wouldn't even necessarily need to hire a lawyer. Um, as I mentioned, the Copyright Claims Board is not part of the court system. 
but it does make binding determinations. Um, and I've seen the word tribunal used to pretty often to describe it. Um, they don't use that word themselves. The CCB is made up of three board members recommended by the Register of Copyrights and appointed by the Librarian of Congress. Um, they serve staggered terms, so there will be some continuity and overlap of board members. Um, and they will have at least two copyright lawyers, um, as well as like administrative staff to help and advise them. Um, something I read said two lawyers, but I think it's actually at least two. Um, and one very important aspect of this situation is that the CCB can only review registered works. So we all probably know that copyright covers even works that are not registered, but if a creator wants to file a claim under the CASE Act, they will need to register their work. Um, and the timing of when they register their work can also be important because it can impact the amount of damages awarded in a determination. Um, the language of the law refers to timely registered works. Um, and I am not 100% sure what that means, but I think, I believe that it mean it refers to whether the work was registered before or after whatever sort of infringing action that the claimant is filing about. So, um, you know, if a claimant has the, their work registered um, and then there is an infringement, um, they would potentially be eligible for um, higher damages than if they, there was an infringement and then they registered their work. Um, so, and again, I may be mistaken about exactly what that means. Um, but for timely registered works, the statutory damages for infringement are capped at $15,000. Um, and for works that are not timely registered, statutory damages are capped at $7,500. Um, so the, the CCB can hear multiple claims at once, but the maximum for any one proceeding is $30,000. Um, and claimants can also request actual damages, um, but that's still also, that's still capped at $30,000. I'm sorry, my cat is destroying things. Um, so although we're dealing with lower barriers to entry and the words may be much lower than they could be in federal court, I think, I, I mean, the federal court awards are, you know, like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but we're, we're still talking about amounts of money that are potentially really significant for the average person. And so calling it small claims <laughs> is a sort of euphemistic in my opinion. Um, and so a final crucial detail um, is that this process is not required um, for either the claimant or the respondent. So a claimant can still choose to file in federal court if they prefer to. Um, and when a respondent receives the notice of a claim against them, they can also opt out of the process. Um, and in that case, a claimant would be required to file in federal court if they wanted to continue pursuing a case. Um, so this is a pretty, uh, simplified overview of the process. Um, and like I said, the CCB can only review claims for works that are registered with the Copyright Office. So if a work is not registered, the claimant needs to do that first. Um, and I've linked to the like registration site right there. Um, uh, the process doesn't have to be completed with a certificate like in hand 
but the claimant will need to provide documentation that they have um, filed for registration. Um, the claimant then files with the CCB um, and we don't yet have a specific process for that outlined, um, but they once they filed, they will need to serve a notice of the claim to the respondent. Um, and the respondent will also receive a notice from the CCB directly. So at this point, the respondent can opt out of the proceeding, which would mean that the claimant would have to then file through the federal court process if they wanted to continue. Um, the respondent can also respond if they wanna stay in the small claims process and they may choose to file a counterclaim um, if they believe that uh, they are actually the owner of this work. Um, there is the possibility that the claimant would be willing to settle directly with the respondent and to cancel their filing. But I'm, I like assume that's likely to be an option, but I'm not sure we know enough about that part of the process yet. Um, I, I feel like there, there has to be a way that people will be able to withdraw their filings, but um, we just don't know yet. Um, and finally, respondents can, but shouldn't <laughs> ignore the notices that they receive um, and not show up to the hearing. But it sounds like that's <laughs> uh, pretty much going to result in it's you know, a default determination against them, sort of like not showing up to court in a lawsuit. Um, so after some specified time for responses and a limited amount of discovery, the Copyright Claims Board hears the claim virtually, um, and that's part of the law is that it's a virtual hearing, um, and they make a determination. Uh, the virtual aspect is interesting to me because it, I mean, it absolutely makes it cheaper and easier and more accessible for everyone involved rather than, you know, needing to travel and pay for a hotel. Um, so, and there are some procedures laid out for an appeal process after your determination is made, but this is the basic process. I do not expect anyone to be able to read this slide. <laughs> um, I, but I wanted to show it because I think it does a good job of kind of showing the different options and how they might play out um, and kind of showing how complicated and confusing it might be for the claimants and the respondents. Um, I will say it's a little bit it is older, I think it's from 2020. So this is, I mean, it is designed before the act was finally passed, um, but it is, I will say it has some sort of like loaded language and some assumptions, but um, I still think it's a good resource and I've linked to it there um, in the title. Um, so the case act does provide some ways that the copyright claims board can safeguard against claimants acting in bad faith. Um, and this includes dismissing all pending claims for a claimant. Um, they may ban them for a year. They may award um, reasonable costs and attorney fees to the other party that they may have incurred in the um, process. Um, and I don't think these necessarily only apply to claimants. So if a respondent files a counterclaim in bad faith or deliberately lies about or misrepresents some information, um, some of these um, might be imposed on them as well. And the last two bullet points are not necessarily things that apply only to bad actors. Um, the CCB may limit the number of claims a person can file in a year, which seems like a distinct possibility to me. It's a very small, I mean, you've got three people and 
if it's as easy to use this process as they say it, I mean, it seems like they could get overwhelmed very quickly needing to process um, these filings. Um, and they also do have the discretion to dismiss cases without making a determination. Um, but those are, there's very specific reasons laid out. Um, and so they may decide that there's simply, you know, not enough evidence or something to make a determination. There are a lot of things we don't know yet. <laughs> Um, the, the Copyright Office is accepting public comments on rulemaking until April 26. So if you've got a hot take about this, you still have a couple of days to submit them. Oh, I should have linked to that. I didn't link to that, um, but there's, it's pretty findable on the Copyright Office page. Um, and I, I think you can just submit information in a text box. Um, the deadline for implementation of the CASE Act is in December, but they can push that back some, I think it's like six months, um, if there's good reason. So um, like, you know, a pandemic, uh, it may be as late as June of next year, June 2022, before they start accepting filings and have all of the procedures laid out. Um, and related to rulemaking, we don't know how um, easy it will actually be for people to navigate this process, um, especially if they're trying to do it without a lawyer's help or an expert. Um, and we don't know anything about procedures for discovery, summoning witnesses, documenting evidence, um, calculating actual damages. Um, so there's just a lot we don't know. Um, the filing fee has to be, <laughs> this is really specific, but it has to be at least a hundred dollars and not more than the cost of filing in federal court. And I didn't try to go find that particular information, but that's as specific as it gets, at least a hundred dollars and less than filing in federal court. Um, and there's a couple of things that I, I really think we won't understand until the CCB starts making determinations. And that's things like how heavy handed they're willing to be with assigning damages or with labeling someone to be bad, acting in bad faith. Um, part of the reason it's hard to know is that in some places, they kind of depict this as a mediation process rather than um, an adjudication process. And so it's just really difficult to know um, how, how they're going to come at this. Um, so do we have any questions yet before I move on? I haven't seen any questions come in through the chat. Um, okay. but if anyone has any, um, I think this is a good time to ask. So maybe we'll give folks a couple seconds to type or unmute. Yeah, feel free to unmute or that's easier. Okay, I think we're probably good. Okay. Um, cool. But I will let, let you know if other ones come up. Okay. Um, so moving on to why the CASE Act is so controversial to many stakeholder groups. Oops, I did the thing with my computer again. Um, so there's a number of concerns for creators who might want to use the small claims process. And these are just a few of the problems. And they're ones that have occurred to me that I haven't necessarily found like floating out in the internet somewhere. Um, and there may be many other problems that people identify. Um, so the ease of navigating the process, like I said, is very much to be determined 
Um, and it may end up being very well designed to guide people through the process. But I think just understanding everything involved can get complicated. Um, I would, <laughs> so this, the other part of this is that I, I would venture to say that most harmful or damaging copyright infringement um, these days is facilitated by the internet um, and the anonymity in, in the internet um, makes it very difficult to use the case act process because it can be difficult to identify who to file a claim against. Um, especially if you're trying to do this without um, expert help. Um, and in egregious cases, creators may not be able to use the system. Um, I follow a lot of artists on Instagram because if you don't, what are you using Instagram for? Um, <laughs> and there's a couple of people that I follow who have had their work taken, like repeatedly, they've had this problem, taken and sold on site, sites like Shine or Shein, I'm not exactly sure how do you say that, but that's a fast fashion company based in China. Um, and they, you know, they take an artist's images or graphics and put them on clothing or housewares. Um, sometimes they change the colors slightly or Photoshop it just a little bit, but sometimes they don't even like remove the artist's watermark. Um, and so unfortunately, creators are going to continue to struggle with this type of copyright infringement because they're not able to file against non-US companies and individuals um, unless they're filing a counterclaim initiated by a foreign entity. So that's not helpful for folks. I, and I, that's to me a really big like downside um, to this whole thing. Um, but other, other creators who might benefit from using the process to file against infringing American companies are also unlikely to be able to use it because um, well-funded offenders are just gonna know better, they're gonna opt out of the process. Um, because when you make it, making it harder for someone to seek redress um, and, you know, forcing someone to file a federal lawsuit means that they're much less likely to um, pursue that. And that's just unfortunate. <laughs> there are also a ton of concerns for average internet users. Um, if they receive a notice, they may not have any idea what to do about it or what it means. Um, and again, I, I'm hoping that the notification letters are standardized and uncomplicated and in plain language. But um, as a person who has gotten communications from the government, I haven't really received any that are nice and clear and straightforward like that. So I'm not super duper optimistic about um, about that aspect of things. Um, so again, there's a concern that people will be confused by the process, maybe stick letters in a pile in their home office and forget about it, um, which is really probably the worst thing they could do in the situation. Um, and the cost of hiring or just consulting a lawyer is also a concern, especially for people who don't feel they're liable because um, they may want advice um, and really not need it. And we, I, again, we just don't know that, but um, th that's just another concern. Um, and so like back to the internet, um, I think of most internet users as essentially like chaotic neutral characters um, and I think that's been pretty normalized. Um, people aren't probably um, 
most people are not actively pirating movies or selling stolen designs on Redbubble, um, but they probably also don't really understand fair use and sort of think that if they find it on the internet, then they can use it on the internet. Um, a very smart person I know who is a faculty member at a different university um, was contacted a while back about an image he used on his personal blog. Um, and it was actually several years ago that this blog post um, went up. And he, he thought it was fair use because it was relevant to his blog post. Um, he wasn't profiting financially off the post in any way, um, but I would not have said it qualified as fair use. It wasn't transformed in any way. There was no like kind of deconstruction of the image um, and the text of the post itself would have been fine. It would have the exact same meaning um, without use of the image. Um, but fair use assessments are not something the average chaotic neutral internet user really understands, um, if at all. And that brings me to copyright trolls. Um, there's a, a number of different um, ways you might see copyright troll used, but uh, as it relates to us, um, copyright trolls buy up image copyrights typically um, from the current owners or they act on behalf of the owners in a predatory way. Um, they identify internet users like my friend who may not have properly licensed the images for use. Um, typically like people who own their own business and function as their own web designer or people who, with a personal website or blog. And instead of simply sending a takedown notice, copyright trolls threaten to sue um, and offer to settle or they may offer to license the content for a relatively large sum of money. Um, so like I said, there's some other examples of copyright trolling that are more high profile um, and kind of closer to the sense of um, the idea of uh, patent trolling, if you're familiar with that concept. Um, but this is, this is the type of thing that people who are worried about the case act um, are worried about because they worry that um, this process will actually facilitate copyright trolls um, by making it so much easier and cheaper to file complaints. Um, so there's the fear that a person will be served with a notice um, and it's like, you know, we've already filed against you, you have to send us this amount of money or else. And it's um, potentially much more scary for people. Um, and the thing is that copyright trolls aren't necessarily doing something illegal. Um, although some trolls may actually just be scammers <laughs> sending threatening letters, but um, even the quasi legal copyright trolls are they're basically extorting people who really weren't profiting off of use of a work and weren't acting in bad faith, but still used an unlicensed image. That's kind of, you know, they were in the wrong and they're probably happy to take down the image, um, but maybe they still owe money. So finally, we get the concerns within academia and this is, this is where I'm really not exactly sure how realistic some of these fears are or how worried we need to be. Um, I've linked to a recent op-ed article on my resources slide that I think does a good job breaking down the case act. So I, I mean, I recommend it for that reason anyway, but um, I also recommend it, it for kind of another library perspective and some of the fears are that publishers will become even more restrictive in, about documenting explicit copyright permissions. 
um, which are something that's often required by the publisher, but not technically necessary because the uses fall under fair use, um, like clearly fall under fair use. Um, so that seems like a possible outcome, although I feel like publishers have pretty much, I feel like that's probably already, like they're probably already pretty strict about that. Um, but I, I don't know, maybe they will become even more restrictive. Um, and the article I mentioned also takes the position that scholars will be intimidated by the changes um, and restrict the types of intellectual and creative work that they're willing to engage in. And again, I maybe, I, I don't know, we'll have to see. Um, so what is all of this, all the technical details, requirements, supposed safeguards, the potential problems. What does all of this mean for us as a library, as a public university, or as individuals? And what does it mean for our community members? So <laughs> I want to emphasize that nothing has changed for us as a library um, as a result of the case set. Copyright itself hasn't changed in any way. Um, fair use is still a thing. Libraries and archives retain all our exemptions under Section 108. Um, and it, the Case Act specifies that federal and state entities cannot be named as respondents. So the status quo for public college and university libraries and archives is maintained. Um, private libraries and archives are not exempt by default in the way that public institutions are, but there is a provision that allows them to preemptively opt out of the small claims process rather than um, you know, receiving a notice and waiting to respond to something. They can preemptively opt out, and again, that would maintain the, um, the status quo for them. And that's something they almost certainly want to do. So we don't need to panic. Nothing has really changed for us as a library. Um, but as for us as individuals um, and you know, the individuals in the communities we serve, um, there's a lot of misunderstanding um, about copyright already. So I don't think it's reasonable to expect, you know, wide swaths of the public to be keeping up with these details. Um, but I do think that some folks like faculty and students in the visual arts could probably just really benefit from understanding how they may benefit from the case act, um, as well as, you know, possible repercussions they should be aware of. Um, and so we generally, we should know generally what the CASE Act is. We should know where we can find information about it. Like if we receive a notice, but it's also possible that as library workers, we'll eventually get some questions about it. Um, so we'll want to be able to provide resources for other people. And probably goes without saying, but don't steal stuff on the internet. Um, you know, be cautious, but I don't think we need to worry um, as long as we, you know, continue to be conscientious about our internet use. Um, again, that's me being cautiously optimistic, which is a, probably a change for me. Um, so what else do we need to do? And these, these points kind of emerged from the last slide. Um, as, as library folks, I think this is something we probably just want to keep track of generally as implementation continues to happen. Um, and especially as we start getting a sense of how the CCB will make determinations, um, what kind of things they're willing to tolerate. And as things develop and we get more specific information, I think we'll also get more discussion in like academic library circles. 
And at some point we may want to incorporate this into like info lit instruction. Um, possibly just in a passing way, but for fields like visual and possibly like performing arts. Um, for now, I think it's just really important to emphasize what fair use is and what it isn't. Um, I'm sure you ROI types already, that's the, your deal. Um, I, and you probably or may already do this, I have no idea. Uh, I think it could be really useful to talk about fair use and things like Creative Commons licensing within the context of internet use um, uh, and kind of outside like an academic paper presentation sort of thing. Um, and you know, whether that's a personal website or social media or whatever, I think just that like paradigm of fair use may be helpful in avoiding um, case act filings altogether. This is just, I have just two resources that I think are really good here, um, but there's a much longer list at the Google doc on the last bullet point. Um, the article in the Journal of Copyright in Education and Librarianship is the one that I mentioned earlier. Um, it has a good synthesis of the case act and discusses, discusses some potential issues in academia. Um, I think the copyright.gov link um, is also like actually pretty good, especially if you're looking, they have, a, I feel like they have a pretty good FAQ page um, and they have just a lot of resources linked. So if you're looking for like more specific details, that's probably a pretty good place to go. Um, and I'm hoping that once the CCB has everything set up and all of their rulemaking done, um, and are actually hearing claims that it, I'm hoping that it'll be really useful for people trying to find them, you know, information because they're trying to navigate the process for themselves. Um, so this is my slides template. Um, do we have questions? Right. Do we have nothing but questions? <laughs> Um, we haven't had questions that came up yet in the chat. I commented in the chat, oh no, because my 16 year old niece really loves that shine. Oh yeah, there's like, um, they're, interesting. There's a, I mean, if something is really cheap on the internet, it's probably sketchy and unethical. Yeah. <laughs> like that's just like kind of any, any clothing that you get. It's true, yeah. Um, Sarah. Um, I see that um, Sarah has a hand up. Yes. Oh my gosh. Alyssa, this is awesome. And I love the slide where you said, don't worry. Um, <laughs> it's like, don't panic. Okay. Um, I really felt extremely um, well informed and I mean, better than, you know, an hour ago. Good. And, and but also I feel like um so this is this isn't necessarily a question about your presentation, but it's a question about future speak. And if I if I had a question about this, I feel like I would my first step would be to contact you. <laughs> and are you okay with that? <laughs> I I mean with like the caveat that I'm not an expert. I right, will right, help right. you try to answer your question and find information about what you're looking for. I'm Wonderful. No, I mean that that I already feel more empowered. <laughs> <laughs> and I, like the um, I the resources slide, um, it's go dot It's the go link and the. I'll just put it back in the chat. Okay. Okay. Um, but the link on my resources slide to like um, the Google Doc. The Google Doc. Um, yep. There's like a lot more background information, and um, so I I I only put stuff on there that I thought was interesting, and I included like tried to, to put a variety of perspectives. Okay. Well, and I I kind of assume that because 
eventually, I mean, it's not up and running yet. So when that happens, I assume there'll be another flurry of, you know, publications and right. stuff. And I mean, I'm sort of hoping for that. Um, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, thank you again. Hot, anybody got a hot take? <laughs> Uh, Anna shared, uh, well, actually, this is not really a hot take because I think a lot of us feel this way. She she said, this was great. I'm so scared of copyright. <laughs> so I think that's a lukewarm take. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to just mention, you know, I really liked your ideas at the end there about information literacy. And um, I have taught definitely about fair use in certain situations. Um, and creative commons in, in some of those and also some other situations. Um, but it is something I'd like to be able to do more. One of my liaison areas is media studies and I've been trying to like get in with them to, to talk about this, but, but mostly I think their, their take is, oh, well, everything we make is in an educational context um, right now. So it's all fair use. And I wanna be like, I could, really help you yeah more, I, more I do think that. it's really important to understand like in a broader like a broader context I think it's it's really important but this is what we do right now yeah yeah well and when I talk about plagiarism in my classes I always talk about you know there are legal implications hello it's not just you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily just get kicked out of school but you know, you could lose a job and, you know, I, I try to make it as serious as possible, but who knows? Okay, we have a question in the chat from Dallas. Do you think publishers will file claims against academic social networking sites like academia.edu academia and researchgate.net? That's a great question. Yeah. Um... I, I mean, if I had to guess, I'm going to say no, because if they're probably going to be seeking more, because it's so expensive to have lawyers um, just to retain them. And in a situation like that, publishers are going to have lawyers anyway, and filing basically to hopefully come out with $30,000 for them is really small potatoes compared to you know what they could get in federal court and i think academia or yeah academia.edu and researchgate um to some degree they function as platforms rather than um because the material doesn't exist until the author puts it there. So um, this might fall under like another, there's like something about takedown notices with the DCMA or something. I, I don't um, really know, but they might be trying to, they might more be more likely to penalize authors than unfortunately than the platforms. That's my guess. All right, last call for questions. Anybody got any questions? Of course you can, um, you know, how to contact Alyssa. And as she said, if she doesn't know, she will not. I, if I don't know, I will not, I will tell you that I have no idea. <laughs> there we go. That's all we can really ask for in yeah. these times. All right, thank you everyone. Thanks so much, Alyssa, um, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, this will be up on the UL, well, on the University Libraries YouTube, and then on the ULVLC LibGuide. Um, hopefully by the end of the day today. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact Alyssa. If you have questions or ideas about ULVLC stuff, 
please contact me. I'm still looking for content to get us through the rest of this semester. Um, so if you have um, any ideas, please feel free to share. And we do have a fun session next week that's a ULVLC library instructional technology collab um, where we are going to um, talk about you know some of the try try to do some silver linings. What are some of the things that you've learned to you learned or used during this pandemic that you're going to keep? Because um, I know I have a couple of things that um, have come have come out of this that are useful. So all right, everyone, have a great rest of your day, um, and I will see you all soon.